Thanks, everyone. We've got a big crowd again today, so thanks for coming. Um, this is week two of our uh, pass through the generative AI with large language models Coursera course. Um, so the the structure of this, what we're what we're trying to do today, is I've kind of got a course outline together. The assumption is that you've actually done week two on your own. And so I won't be reteaching it. It will just be kind of discussion. We can dig a little bit deeper on things. Maybe you didn't understand something. Maybe you wanted a little bit more um, discussion around why X is better than Y and, and stuff like that. Um, so that that's the point of this session, not necessarily a reteaching, just a, a forum so that we can discuss these topics um, and kind of exchange notes. Um, so I'll, I'll take us through this course outline, and then I'll also have us take a little look at the PEFT library. Um, so we'll go through the Hugging Face PEFT documentation a little bit and just see kind of what's out there, because they gave us one look at it with the with the lab in the week, but we can also look a bit more at like, here's all of the other options that are in there. They, they showed us one thing and there's a whole library there. Um, so I'll pull that up and I'll, I'll show it to everyone and we can kind of just pick at what the different options are. Um, and then if we have time, we'll also go through a little bit of the lab walkthrough. So we'll just check things out um, and see exactly, um, exactly what they taught us there. So first, first chunk that they gave us was talking about instruction fine tuning. So actually last week, Kirk asked a, asked a question about this. He was saying like these models, they're just guessing the next word. So how does it follow our instructions? And that's where this instruction fine tuning comes in. So initially you have these models, they're just guessing the next word on all of the internet. So it's just guessing the, the next most probable word. Um, but actually what we want it to do is to guess the word that that maximizes our happiness kind of so it's it's saying how do i how do i give the user what they want really so we give it these instructions and we say okay when i tell you to summarize this i expect this back and it's very very good at learning this preference rather than just guessing the most likely next word and so that that's the purpose of this instruction fine tuning so you you gather a data set just like you would any other supervised training problem and you just kind of say here's the text description of what i want you to do here's the response i expect back um and then with enough data it will learn to do that and you've kind of shifted your base model from just guessing the next word to guessing the response that you want back um, and it'll be cohesive English because it's learned all of that from um, its its base pre-training setup. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to, to show for a second is um, here's just one example. Um, so this is uh, Meta posting some weights on Hugging Face. And so you can see that there's, there's different variants of these weights. And so you might want the Llama 2 base weights, the ones that were just trained against the internet, or you might want the chat ones, the ones that they actually trained against some instruction tuning in order to respond back in the way that we're kind of used to. If you actually interact with these models, they're, they seem kind of dumb. They don't, they don't follow what you're doing. They're good at guessing the next word, but they're not good at actually following your direction. So if you're playing with these models, you probably want the chat variant and pretty much every model that's that's out there will will have a uh, like base pre-train that's available and then a chat uh chat uh instruct tuned model that will kind of respond back like you expect chat gpt um and i actually think that the jump between these two is one of the most valuable steps like we had gpt 3.5 and everyone kind of looked at it and said okay that's cool but then the the big unlock was when we actually instruct tuned it and it's like wow this is amazing it follows my directions it does what i tell it to um and so that that made it a million times more more valuable than uh just guess the next word it was it was just fancy autocomplete before um so one one option, like the, the first most basic option is just single instruct tuning. So you have a single thing that you're trying to teach the model to do. So you want it to do summarization and you, you tell it to do various different summarization things. So you say, 
summarize the the preceding paragraph or give me a summary of what was just discussed or or something like that. And so you have a single task that you can have multiple different ways to describe it. Um, and so that can make it robust to that one thing. But in reality, what you want is it to be able to kind of generalize to anything that the user would ask it. And so this multitask instruct tuning is kind of saying, let's get data sets covering a bunch of different things. And then the, here, the theory behind it is instead of just learning to summarize, it learns more generically, like the user is going to ask me some sort of question and I want to respond back in a reasonable way. And you can't get that if you only teach it to summarize. But if you show it a hundred, a thousand different kinds of tasks, then it can actually generalize and say, like, here's kind of a broad range of these things that we want to do. And it can even extend beyond those a thousand. It can it can do many other things because it's it's been um, multitask trained. Um, anyone a pause, ask any questions about instruct training? I'll just add a quick comment that even for a single task like summarizing, they used a variety of prompts. So like if you have a thousand tasks, you don't even have a thousand formats. You probably have 5,000 different ways that it phrased the initial request. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's actually really important because if you if you teach it the same input question every time, then it's not going to be robust to other ways that people phrase the same thing. So if you say summarize this every single time, and then someone says, "Can you please summarize this?" it might not understand it anymore because it was only taught under that exact condition to give that certain kind of response. Um, so yeah, the the variation on on the input is actually very valuable. Um, so the, the next section, they spent a bit of time discussing how you evaluate these models. Um, and they, they discussed Rouge and Blue. Um, and I'm not personally a huge fan of these metrics. It gives kind of a vague direction of, of the quality of the model. You're, you're just kind of looking at unigrams and biograms and saying, does it look like the vocabulary is similar? But in reality, the, the, actual like it, it's not evaluating truthfulness or if it got the question right or if it did what you wanted um it can get things completely wrong and actually have a decent score if it just kind of hits on the right vocabulary correctly so um these are valuable things to know but i i personally don't like them that much and this this third method that i listed they didn't show in the course but a lot of people have been using it and so i i kind of advocate for this. Um, so the the LLM as a judge is kind of this interesting concept where you have the model judge its own performance. So there's some difficulty associated with actually generating the right answer. And it's actually much easier for the models to verify if that was correct. So if it says like the capital of France is blah, 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 it's difficult because it's going one word at a time and then it's trying to generate the answer and you can have an LLM take a second pass on it and say, did the model get this correct? And it's actually more accurate than the model is at generating. So um, one method is taking a human and saying, okay, manually evaluate all of these responses and see if they're correct, but that's not scalable at all. And we found that the LLMs are so accurate that you can actually use them as a judge. And that's a better proxy than Rouge or Blue or, or some of these other things. So there's a lot of good data sets out there that can kind of give you a very broad um, understanding of how they perform across a lot of different tasks. Um, but those those specific metrics, um, they're decent, but I, I wouldn't take that as my as my first option at this point. Um, and so there there's a bunch of these different benchmark data sets. Some of them have kind of become defunct at this point. So there's glue and super glue. Um, and I would they they mention them, but I would say that these are basically completely obsolete at this point because we, we had these tasks, we built these models and they kept getting better and better and better. And now they're at the point where the, 
they claim that we're superhuman on these tasks, but it's because it's such a narrow range of stuff that our models are actually very good at. Um, and we've kind of reached a ceiling on them where it's like, okay, they, they beat humans by one or 2% and now there's nothing else to gain. So our 70 billion model is the same as 175 billion model. And, and there, there's just no stratification anymore because um, we, we've just reached the limit on those tasks. So if you, if you go over to the, to the website where those um, are hosted, glue and super glue, people haven't even really been posting models to that leaderboard anymore because it's kind of just considered solved. Um, so these were data sets that were mentioned, but I, I wouldn't really put too much stock into them. Um, and then the next one is MMLU. That was another one that they mentioned. Um, and this is, I don't remember exactly what the, what the acronym stands for, but it's a collection of many, many different data sets and um, measuring their performance on, on stuff that's actually much more difficult. And so if you look at the performance on them, there's a very big difference between a 7 billion parameter model and a 70 billion parameter model. Um, you, you can truly see that there's a, there's a performance gap between them. Um, and the, the larger models really shine on these things. They, they've, they've got it at the right difficulty level that you can actually see um, in uh, objectively in the numbers, what's better and what's worse. Um, and I, I think that this is better than, than those other metrics. It's kind of an objective thing across enough tasks that you can, you can get a very good view of um, big bench. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm not super familiar with big bench, but I know that there, there was some, paper where they they kind of talked about this and I linked it to someone last week it might have been that paper um but yeah I mean there there's research popping up showing that like you can kind of plug in an LLM as almost as good of a as good of a annotator as a human they're they're good at verifying they're not as good at generating and so that's kind of the big the big struggle Yeah, so the, the model evaluates itself by, I mean, a, a lot of the times people aren't evaluating their own model against itself. They're having GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 or some other really good model evaluate their own. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll have their little 7 billion parameter model, and then they do inference on a bunch of things. And then they look at it and they go, how do we evaluate this? And actually what you can do is you can go pass it to GPT 3.5 and you can say, did the model get this correct? And it will actually be a, a very good evaluator of those models. And it can sit there and just say yes, no. Um, and so that's, that's how you do it is a lot of the times what you do is you have a smaller, weaker model and then you have a big mega model and you say, um, just check the performance on on this, and it can actually do a good enough job that it that can it can really tell a difference. Um, at my company, we have some people who are specifically working on various evaluation stuff like that, um, and it there's problems with it. It's not perfect. So, like one of the things that they figured out is that just the order of answers that you give it. So like one of the evaluation metrics that they do is they say like, here's model A, here's model B's output, chat GPT 3.5, pick which one you like better. And they found that it almost always preferred the first entry over the second entry, regardless of the quality of the text. And so um, it's definitely not perfect, but you get, you get a evaluation that's much closer to what a human would do versus these other metrics where you you can't really tell if it's actually better it might just be getting vocabulary right but not the order or might be getting negations wrong or it might be getting the like in in some of these like there might be one word that determines if it's right or wrong so you say what is the capital capital of france and it gets all of the words correct except for the actual capital it's not correctly weighted if you just say, okay, you got all of the words correct, except for the thing that is actually the answer. Um, and so those, those 
uh, kind of LLM evaluation models are, are good at pushing that. Um, so there, there are issues with using um, GPT to improve your model, but mostly that's, that's focused on using it to generate data to then train again. So you can't say basically GPT 3.5 generate a million samples and then I'm going to go train my model to copy that, but you can use it to evaluate it. Um, you just can't use it to like generate training data. So it's a little bit of a workaround where you just say, okay, I'm going to pass my generations to uh, GPT 3.5 and that's going to become the judge. Um, but you're not actually using that to then train the model more. Um, so in, in theory, none of none of the information from one model has has leaked into the other. You've just kind of informed your decision of what's better and what's worse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's not not perfect, and I'm I'm sure that there's some interpretation of the law there, but that's that's how things seem to stand today. Um. And then going going back to the data sets, um, there's Helm, and I think I saw that in the in the diagram, MMLU is actually a part of Helm. It, it was one of their checkboxes. It looked like, um, so that's that's something that I've seen kind of consistently. It seems like there's this kind of race to like let's just aggregate all of these data sets and keep repackaging and keep building a bigger and bigger set across all of these things. So. Um, I'd, I'd have to double check this, but I think that MMLU is actually inside of Helm as well. Um, so it seems like we're we're in this kind of interesting spot where um, our data sets keep just getting re-aggregated and re-added. Um, but there's there's a lot of different benchmark data sets that you can look at. And there's, there's Hugging Face has leaderboards for various different tasks. So they have leaderboards for um, embeddings and for the large language models and um, a bunch of other stuff. And so if you're ever looking for a model that's particularly good at one thing, you can look at their leaderboards and you can you can pull out the details. Um, it's kind of a lot of a lot of them show like an aggregate score saying, oh, we get 90% on this now. But then if you look at it in more detail, there can be a section for question answering and sequence classification. And and so you kind of have to look at what do you actually care about? What's your task? And then dig in and figure out which of these tasks are actually the most relevant to you want what, what you want to do um, and dig into that to, to actually pull the, the best model for your specific thing. So the, the next section, they got a bit into parameter efficient fine tuning. And this is this is something that I've been enjoying and working with a lot lately um, because these models are just so big that you, you can't really interact with them if you don't have a whole cluster of systems or eight, 16 GPUs on a lot of these models. And so this parameter efficient fine tuning um, is kind of just a collection of techniques that are make it much more accessible to to do things with these models. If you want to customize them a little bit, if you want to train against your data set, if you want to try uh, a handful of different techniques, there's this hugging face uh, PEFT library that lets you easily swap in a bunch of these different things and it makes it more compute efficient. It makes it more memory efficient. It, remove it, it removes the catastrophic forgetting aspect because a lot of these leave the models completely intact. You're just training an adapter, or you're training a prompt, or or something else that doesn't actually change the core model. So you you keep that that kind of core functionality that you can still um, use, and then you you kind of tack other things on top of it so that you can get the behavior that you want. Um, so I'm I'm really a big fan of these. Without these, like we're we're not able to do hardly anything with these models unless you're you're one of the compute rich companies. Um, and so this is this is really powerful because it gets you orders of magnitude less parameters and memory, um, and it, it's just really really useful. 
Um, and so in the later sections, we'll look at there's uh, different methods for this. So there's a there's a slew of different options that you can plug in and they have different trade offs in terms of how many parameters are you training? How much memory is that going to use? What's the accuracy you're going to get out of it? What's the scalability of it going to be? Um, can you easily swap these out and do a bunch of them all at once? Um, and so we'll we'll look at two different options after this. And then after that, we'll we'll look at PEFT and, and see what the other options are. Um, so one of them that you might have heard about recently is LoRa. Um, and so it's basically this idea that you can decompose the the matrices and then you you train much smaller, less expressive weights. Um, and this saves you uh, a whole bunch of space. So instead of training the the full matrix and having all of this uh, memory usage and compute, you can you can train in a much smaller space. Um, and everyone's everyone's been using this and playing with this and and seeing how it interacts. And it's actually kind of incredible because you can get nearly full performance, but you you have to pay, a tiny fraction of the cost, just a just a percent of it, um, and so if you're if you're interested in that method, there's a whole paper associated with it, and there's there's Laura, and then there's Q Laura that you might hear about, and the the idea behind Q Laura is just basically quantizing the weight. So we talked about it in a in a previous week. Um, you can reduce the precision that you're storing these weights in. Um, and that saves you a bunch of memory as well. And so there's this paper QLora where they talk about quantizing and what what trade-offs you can get in terms of reducing the precision and also doing LoRa at the same time. Um, so you can get um, the the much lower memory usage while also getting very, very high accuracy. Um, so a lot of people have been um, doing a lot of stuff with LoRa. So one of one of the um, steps with this is um, you train at at the lower rank and then you kind of broadcast it back to your original weights and this is this is nice but um, it also means that if you're trying to do multiple different LORAs at once you have to kind of merge these weights back together multiple times or swap between different adapters and that can take extra time. So if you're saying, I want one strong base model, and then I want to swap a whole bunch of um, LoRa's on top of it for all of the different stuff that I've I've fine-tuned it for, um, you can do that, but there, there's some associated cost to kind of uh, swap those around and, and merge, in the, merge in the weights. Um, I see- hey, Ryan, can I the, add a yeah. comment about that? Yeah, so so one of the things is that actually computing the matrix multiply of B times A for a GPU is very fast. Even though these are you know pretty big. And even adding the product of B times A to your frozen weights is relatively fast. What's orders and orders of magnitude slower is copying something from main memory into the GPU. So the thing that I haven't quite figured out is that I think you still generally don't have enough GPU memory to just have these A and B matrix uh, vectors, small, low rank matrices, just sitting around pinned to memory. Uh, but if you did, then hypothetically, it's not that expensive to uh, to actually do the, the the math part. Actually, is surprisingly fast. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I want to add something here. Yeah, go ahead. So the weight update is still B times A matrix, right? It's being done on that. Only the uh, saving those lower ranks uh, in the memory will be B and A vectors, right? Those will be saved. But when you when we update those weights, when, when you do forward pass, still it will be done on that matrix. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and one one extra piece of this is is you can actually change the amount of reduction that you're doing. 
so you can you can change the the ratio there so one of the things that they showed was you can you can go from one to one so you have the full rank matrices or you you can go different reductions on top of that um and so it, it's kind of impressive that you can do these extremely low rank things that aren't nearly as expressive don't have nearly as many parameters but they get nearly the same performance out actually um and this is kind of i i don't know how to describe this but at, at my company people have basically been saying that laura is good for changing style but it's not necessarily good at um injecting knowledge into the model um so you're not changing enough parameters to actually teach it new facts and other stuff but you can teach it to respond in a different way uh because you're you're moving this in such a coarse way that you're not kind of um interacting down at the individual fact level um so i i don't have any paper or proof around that but a lot of people have been saying that is that the lore is not um expressive enough to to like truly change at the fact level it also seems like uh, they do the decomposition at every iteration because when the weights are updated you have a new matrix and then you have new uh components right so that has to be done every iteration does it make sense i i think it's just done once and then at at the end when you want to combine it, it it's reapplied to everything ted do you have extra yeah not sure what you mean when you say the word iteration could you elaborate please yeah yeah so you sorry so uh let's say we have this b and a with vectors right and we multiply them we get the weights and then these are the weights that new knowledge will be loaded in right saved in but they are saved in as two vectors and so when the uh, let's say after we passed uh, some uh, we pass some information through this some uh, right training those weights will be updated at one iteration Does so it make sense? so the the way training works is you actually change the architecture of the network you inject this b and a that are trainable um, such that they get multiplied and they get added to your regular square weight matrices. And then you freeze the square ones so that they're not trainable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you just run uh, training like normal with back propagation and however many iterations, however many epochs you do it, you don't have to do any extra work because you've changed the architecture of the model. The cool thing though, is that in general, when you use adapters, that's what you do is you change the architecture of the model, okay? And even though they're small, it does add an inference cost uh, at prediction time, okay? Um, and the problem for most LLMs isn't that the compute that you do for these adapters is, um, is that heavy. The problem is that because they're different shapes and they're small, they actually mess up the pipelining in your GPU. And so, so uh, when you're just doing regular base LLMs with with full full um, full transformer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, then people have figured out ways to try to really optimize that CUDA pipeline to get all the um, matrix multiplies as you know, as little downtime for your GPU as possible. So that's what people find is that it messes things up in the pipeline, not that the computes themselves cost that much. So the cool thing about Laura that does not apply to other adapters is that once you're done training, instead of saving B and A, what you can do is you can just take the product of B and A and you literally add those onto the frozen weights. So you can do that prior to runtime, if you say, I fine tuned it on my company's proprietary data, that's all I want to do. I'm not doing multiple tasks. This is just the one and only version of the model I care about. Then you take that product, you add it to the weights and you save it. And now you just have a new model in the original architecture with no adapters. 
there's no extra inference cost. You go back to the original architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing that Ryan mentioned, which people talk about, I don't actually know if like any big companies are doing this live in production, is that you can have multiple different tuned LoRa models. You can say, well, this one's really good at math and this one's really good at whatever, you know, booking airline tickets and this one's good at whatever. And so depending on what the user's doing, you could say, oh, I'm going to load the math model. I'm going to load the airline model. But instead of having to load them from scratch, technically all you have to do is have a base copy of the model and then the A and the B, and then you just add those in. And so then if you wanted to switch from the math model to the airline model, technically what you could do is you could take the math B and A, multiply them, subtract them out to get back to your base weights. Then take the B and A for the airline model, multiply them, add them in. And at no point will you have loaded the 70 billion parameters of your base model. You've only got those tiny little A's and B's that you're dealing with. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing, Ryan. Um, so in the Laura paper, what they talk about actually is the, the, the authors wanted to change the behavior of the model. So in fact, if in a transformer, you've got the transformer, uh, the attention layers, and you, you've you got the, the feed forward layers. And tension itself is made up of QKB and also um, projection uh, uh, weights. So in that paper, they really only looked at the attention layers. So they looked at the, 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 the QKB and output weights, and they didn't actually look at the feed forward. Um, so I think if you were interested in changing the knowledge of a model, you could apply uh, LoRa to your feed forward layers. Um, but the default is that it's only going to apply to the tension. And in fact, because of the ablations they did in the paper, it's going to by default only apply it to the Q matrix and the V matrix, only two of the four. Um, so that cuts down on, on the cost by, you know, half. Um, so, so if that's what you really wanted to do was inject proprietary knowledge, like let's say you're a medical company and you needed to learn a lot more vocabulary, then maybe you do need to um, apply it to the to the feed forward part also, not just the not just the attention part. Do you think that? I mean, I, I don't think that there's a, an equivalent at the embedding layer, but I, I would feel like it would happen more at the embedding layer than the feed forward layer that you needed to learn new information. I think it depends, but like if you needed to, if you're doing some medical domain thing and now you don't have a token that represents some disease or something like that, then you might need alteration at the embedding layer. No, no, you're right. Like, yeah, there's, there's, I, I think like medical would be a, a big leap, you know, because there's yeah. just so much, you're right. Yeah. So I think some of it's going to come there. Um, but I think more minor things, uh, I don't even know, but like, you know, we talk about river banks and financial banks. So if you, if you had a model that only knew about river banks and you just wanted to know a little bit about financial banks, like, I think you could, you could, uh, fine tune that in, right? But if you're going to try and teach it all of finance and derivatives mm -hmm. and whatever, then I, I think that's just too much to ask for in in that. Um, but people definitely do do like company specific domain stuff. So like we are a, you know company that does auto repair, so fender benders, dents, paint, scratches, broken windows, you know, and they that they are successful using LoRa to inject um, a little bit of proprietary knowledge into that. Um, there's a question about the training fine tuning. Um, my understanding is, yeah, you you only change the the decomposition decomposition matrices. You don't actually tr touch any of the other weights that that's correct Ted. 
So just to follow up, this is from Raghav. So just to follow up, so then how is this different from adding a you know a couple of more layers on top of the existing uh, model, right? So if we say that you add just one layer or two layers on top of the existing model, you randomly initialize the weights. You don't backprop and update everything. You just update only the weights of the layers which you added. That's, I think, I mean, yeah, in, in its general definition, fine tuning would mean you fine tune everything. But I think, you know, before LoRa term was introduced, at least to me today, I have heard people doing, adding only, you know, two layers or three layers, fine tuning only those, back, back propagating to only those. So then how is this different from that? I think it's a great question. So, um, so part of it is just how much it costs you and part of it is performance. So to your point, I think sort of the very rough histories, the first thing people looked at is, and, and I think this was in the course, is instead of fine tuning the entire model, what if I freeze some of the weights and I just leave some of them? So like if it has 12 transformer layers, maybe I'll freeze the first 10 and I'll leave the last two, okay? And people found that you can get a little bit of performance doing that, but in the end, it wasn't really very satisfying. So then came the series of adapters and so adapters means that you're actually changing the architecture of your network. And so people said, ah, yeah, what if I have a 12 layer model and I just add a 13th layer, randomly initialized, and now I, I freeze the others and I back prop through this and I train it. And so that's kind of what you're saying. And in fact, people did that and they found that it works better because you're adding a whole bunch of weights. It works better than just fine tuning the last couple layers of your base model, okay? Uh, but then people said, wow, you know, like a whole layer that's kind of heavy handed. And so then they came up with the idea of adding small adapters sprinkled throughout your model. So like in each of the 12 layers, I add a small little something. OK, and that's really what people tend to think of when they think of as adapters. And um, I'm blanking on the name of the guy, but the classic adapter would, would look like that, where at each layer you add just something small. Um, and so the compute's not that much. And in terms of training, uh, one of the messages that that I one of the takeaways that I hope you got is that it's not just the uh, the number of parameters that hits your GPU. Um, you need to do math on those, and you need to calculate the activations, and then you need to calculate the gradients on all of those things. And what's crazy is that most people are using Atom. And for every gradient um, that you store, Atom actually needs twice as much memory to, to calculate the momentum features around that. So that's where all your multiples of GPU memory get eaten up. And that's why it's so important to, to reduce the number. So uh, the course didn't really talk about it, but there are other kinds of adapters that people use that are just small little things that you sprinkle throughout. And again, you can decide where you're going to do it. You can only do it with Q. You're going to do it with all QKVO. You're going to do it with the board, whatever. Um, so the, the neat thing about LoRa that's different is that all those other adapters, once you train them, you needed to keep the additional architecture in the model. You have permanently changed your model. With Laura, they said, actually, not only can you do this, but if you want to, you can just add the product of B times A to your original weights and then revert back to your original model. So if somebody, say, has a like hyper-performance optimized inference engine for Llama 7 billion, you can do this Laura fine-tuning of your weights and you can still use their inference because you have not changed the architecture at all. You haven't added anything to the architecture pipeline. So that's kind of like my understanding of the, the, the very high level timeline of people's attempts to get better fine tuning without having to like do the whole thing. Got it, thank you. I, I think that one, one piece of it too is the, um... The, the catastrophic forgetting piece that they mentioned in the course. If you do a new final layer, you're you're probably not going to be able to get out all of that same behavior that you got before. But with Laura, you very likely are. You're, you're probably not going to move your model enough that you're going to lose all of the other stuff that it was taught to do. Um, so that that's a piece of it. It's it's kind of 
how how much are you adding to the model and then how much are you potentially losing and, and what's the cost in terms of parameters and training and there, there's there's different trade-offs everywhere um that that's part of the difficulty paul go ahead okay uh okay two questions uh what what's the approximate time to apply Laura uh, matrix uh, doing that addition and roughly, okay. So it's like a task switching time. Uh, and has anyone, uh, or what happens when you try to apply more than one? Uh, I, I suppose there could be interference between them and that's why we talk about swapping them out. And it, what happens? I mean, is it, does that cause kind of interference? I, I think that the cost of switching is actually not extremely huge like ted was mentioning like people people are training so imagine it, it depends on your base model so your base model might be 7 billion it might be 70 billion and that's a difference between 30 gigabytes and 300 gigabytes and so you can have very very big ranges of um what those can be and then at the same time your your laura depending on the reduction that you can do it can be two megabytes or it can be 200 megabytes. And so swapping them in and out can, can be different amounts of cost. But in general, like if you're, it, the, the typical is probably two to 20 megabytes or something like that. And you can swap that in and out of, of video RAM very quickly. So you can, you can probably you like do it. 10 milliseconds, something like that. Yeah. Or less. I don't know the exact timing, but I would say less than, half a second a quarter of a second something like that okay so um, long as that okay yeah i'd 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 have to try it out but um it, it it i would assume that it is probably faster than the actual inference cost depending on on what you're doing because doing a forward pass on these models might take a second five seconds it, it depends on exactly what you're doing and how long your sequence generation is but I would assume that actually swapping in these weights is probably less than the cost of just doing the whole forward calculation. Hmm. Yeah. So like if you've ever run like a play notebook to, to run some small LLM, I mean, you, you, I don't know, you can quite, it's not that you quite can like make a cup of coffee in the time it takes to load all the weights, but I mean, it takes a while. So like Ryan's saying, if it takes you less than a second to load the A's and the B's, if it was just all one thing, it would probably be even faster. But since it's separate A's and B's and stuff, then it might take a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, you're talking about, I don't know. My guess would be sub-second, maybe even less than 100 milliseconds. And if you hmm. somehow have the A and B pinned in memory, GPU memory, then the multiply uh, and add and whatever, I, I don't know, but... I'm assuming it's it's way less than 10 milliseconds. It might be less than one millisecond. I don't even know. You know, it depends on how well your code pipelines. Ah, okay. Yeah, and then can you apply more than one? Oh, what yeah, so that was add? the other question. So I vaguely recall some people have sort of talked about it. Um, there's a paper, if you're, if you're interested, like this task arithmetic. I don't remember the full title, but it's something about task arithmetic. Uh, I don't think this is that, so no. Um, I don't think you can combine some two Lauras and expect it to work very well. Probably not. Okay. Oh, and I have one more question, just a clarification. Uh, the rank, uh, when the the larger the number, is it is it get, things get smaller or larger or faster? I mean, when, when do they? Well, does it get smaller when it's larger yeah. or when it's small when it's uh, the the rank is lower? So so. Large rank means bigger matrices, more expensive, more memory, more time, more everything. So if your original okay. if your original uh, model has a embedding dimension of 1024, okay, your your Q and V matrices are 1024 by 1024 square matrices. For rank two, the A and the B are each, 1024 by two or two by 1024. So they only have 2000 weights instead of a million. If the rank is uh, one, they only have a thousand weights each. Even if you go up to eight, they have 8,000 weights instead of a million weights. Oh, uh, okay, okay. 
Yeah, sounds cool. All right. So it's two times mm -hmm. that. So you have an A and a B. So so at A, it you'd be sixteen thousand weights versus a million weights. And okay, so they yeah, found so the, that that they so that num typically... that the rank is essentially uh, correlated with the size of that matrix and how how much you're going to apply it. Yep, it's so, an exact linear thing. And, yeah. And, okay. Uh, right. I was uh, wondering if it was a division. That's why I had to ask. Yeah. And so since since ranks of like one or two <laughs> often work, you 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 know. We're not we're not just fudging it when we say low rank. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we did five hundred instead of a thousand. That's not really like saving you that much, right? Yeah, and from the lesson, it seemed that like four was a good value, if that was generalizable. The result that was uh, the testing. I'm not really sure, but I would say that four probably is on the higher end. Even mm. I've never heard of anybody using bigger than eight. But I, I, I'm not doing this every day, so I can't tell you exactly what's state of the art. Um, my guess would be that the bigger your model, the smaller your LoRa can be. So if you're trying to fine tune a mm -hmm. 7 billion, maybe you do need a slightly higher rank, whereas a 70 billion, you might actually get away with one or two. Mm. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks. All right. Look, looking through the the tables that they were showing in the video, I was actually kind of, I don't know, I was looking at the numbers and it was like, if one gets you 69% and whatever the optimal value gets you 71%, it, it to me, it seemed like they, they were like prescribing some range of values. And it was like, it seems like all of these perform quite similarly. So I, I think it depends on your task and whether that one or two percent matters. But to me, it seemed like um, anything like one, two, thirty-two was going to get you pretty good results and a solid boost from from where it started. Probably, um, it always it it's it's hard to say because it always depends on your problem and how you value accuracy and how you value small footprint and and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, my my assessment looking at the table was like it doesn't seem like it matters that much. Um, so the next the next section that they taught us about was soft prompts or prompt tuning, and this is kind of my favorite right now. I've been doing everything with with prompt tuning, um, and so this is kind of the idea that. Um, these models can do what we're asking of them. We just need to ask the right questions, basically. So people have figured out with all of the prompt engineering stuff, like, oh, if I ask it this very specific question, or if I give it this preamble and then ask it the question, it's going to be more accurate. Um, and so people have figured out just like in plain English text, like how do I ask the model the best way in order to get the response that I want out? Um, and this is kind of an evolution on top of that. It's saying like, instead of us kind of varying the words and figuring out the right English to convince the model to do what we want, um, we can directly do gradient descent again. So we can say, here's my input, here's my output. How do I alter the input to actually make the output that I want? So what you do is you you put eight eight virtual tokens is what they call it, or some other number of virtual tokens. And basically what it is, is those are kind of your placeholders of what are you trying to do? They Sometimes they call them task embeddings. Um, so you have these set of tokens and those are kind of, you you learn your, your question that you're trying to ask the model, but you're doing this in the embedding space. You're not doing this in the English space. So it's actually much more expressive because you might not be able to actually ask your question in only eight words, but you can do it in the 1024 times eight weights that are learned and it can learn the magic combo to do what you're doing. Um, so just to kind of rephrase and simplify that, what we're learning is the question to ask the model. We're not actually changing any of the weights of the model. Um, and this is kind of incredible that this can work um, because you would think like, I, I need to change the weights of the model in order to teach it something new. But in reality, the model can understand what you're trying to do most of the time. It's soaked up the entire internet. You just need to ask it the right question to get the behavior that you want. Um, and so I've, I've been a huge 
fan of this and I've, I've built a whole app basically around this concept. And so maybe, maybe I show that at the end of this course, um, I've got this cool prompt tuning demo that, that I've put together. Um, and so one of the powerful things about this is in a previous week, we learned about, um, the in context learning. So basically you give the model some example of what you want to do. You say, here's my input. Here's what I want you to give me. Here's my input. Here's what I want you to give me. And then you give your real input and you say, okay, given the three examples that I just gave you, uh, fill it out similar to, to how I just did. Um, and th that can be very accurate. It turns out that it's good at picking up like, okay, here's, here's the pattern that you're looking for. Um, but it's very inefficient in terms of tokens. So if you show it three examples, um, you you ate up three examples worth of tokens potentially, and you're eating that cost in terms of inference time. You're eating that cost in terms of you can't fit very much in terms of the rest of the context that you have. So if you so one of one of my scenarios that I've been running a lot is. Um, if you want to take a whole page of a document and you want to ask some question of it, um, you can't fit three pages of examples and the output that you want and then your real page and the output that you expect. You're just using way too many tokens and it would be way too slow. You can't fit three pages of text into a prompt. And so this is kind of a workaround of that where you can basically say, I'm going to take those three examples and I'm going to condense them into this task embedding and it's going to describe the way that I want you to extract this information um, and it can be extremely powerful and in, in very very few parameters you're hardly training anything because you're only training these eight embeddings it can it can be eight by 1024 weights and you can learn exactly the task that you're trying to do um, and in the original paper where they where they discussed this they actually found that you can nearly get the full performance of actual fine tuning the model with this as we get bigger and bigger models. So this actually doesn't work if you go all the way back to Bert and Roberta and, and what's considered small models now, they don't have enough parameters to do this. You need these larger models for it to actually work. And so they showed that this green line is the one that we're really looking at, um, that as you get a bigger model, you did this prompt tuning becomes even better. Um, it's it's more and more efficient. Um, and so this blue line down here is sort of the prompt engineering stage where it's like, let's figure out the right words to to ask the correct question of the model. And this is kind of the the analytical gradient descent way of saying, okay, teach the model directly um, the the input question that we need in order to get the response that we want. And it's this magic 20% boost in accuracy. And all you have to do is give it 10 examples or something like that. Um, and so if you look at this, it's like, okay, we we can get beyond GPT 3.5 performance out of a 10 billion parameter model if we just show it 10 examples and then we have the right question embedding to, to give to it. Um, so I'm I'm a big fan of this prompt tuning method. I've been using it a lot. And it's kind of incredible because it one, one of the things in the PEFT library is it shows you like, here's your number number of trainable parameters. And it's like, okay, the, the model is 7 billion and you're only tuning a few thousand and here's your like 0.0003% of the model you're actually training. And then it gets this incredible performance. So um, I'm I'm a big fan of this method. Um, any questions on that? Oh, yeah, I do have a um thought on that. Um, so we're using the the um Flan T five model in the exercise in the lab, and it does have it's small, right? So it actually would be you know on this off this chart on the to the left, right? Yeah, yeah. So. So it and it is apparently doing better than fine tuning to do the LoRa. So maybe there is some improvement over there. I mean, if you um, extrapolate to the left, mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, it I mean, doesn't have to be uh, up to ten to the eighth weights. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, my my experience, I'd have to find the paper again, but there's actually a, a paper on emergent behaviors, and it's basically showing that it's it's not linear as we go up the parameter count. There's there's kind of the lower parameter count where the model will functionally get zero accuracy. It's just not able to learn. And then once you get over some parameter threshold, it will jump up to actually be usable. So that, that'll be different for, for every task. But um yeah, I mean it, it might be possible to to get some value out of out of the Flan T5 model in the example. I actually tried plugging it into the example notebook and I, I didn't have enough time to get it working. But that was that was one of the things that I was looking at is can I get prompt tuning working on this smaller model for the same thing? And then I could bring that here and and show a comparison against Laura. Um, that's something I haven't I haven't thoroughly benchmarked yet. Um, there, there's a lot of different methods between Laura and prompt tuning, prefix tuning, P tuning. There, there's like a million different flavors of all of these things. So I haven't played with all of them yet. Um, yeah, so that's that's all I have in terms of slides, but I can go over to PEFT and I can show that a little bit. Um, so this is this hey, is Ryan. the yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure exactly when to fit in this comment, but I just wanted to share. Um, at the high level, the 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 way the hugging face PEFT library works, to to the best of my knowledge, uh, I definitely don't know it inside out, forwards, backwards. But um, what it's doing is it's expecting your model to have uh, components named a particular way. OK, so, for example, if you're going to apply LoRa and it's going to apply it to the Q and the V weights, your Q and V weights need to be named something like, let's say, Q and V. And so if you bring in a model where the, the Q weights uh, are named uh, Q underscore WT, then basically what's going to happen is when you apply Laura to it, it's going to say, uh, I have no trainable weights because I didn't find anything named Q to apply Laura to. Okay. Um, and I think it works the same way with like the, the prompt tuning, the P tuning, although that's a little less sensitive. But basically, it has to just automatically know where to find the different parts of your LLM uh, in order to, to stick it in. So that's why uh, if you look some places, you'll say, oh, this model is in hugging face format. This model's not in hugging face format. And I think mostly what they're talking about is not the architecture, the transformers and stuff, but just basically like what you named all your different layers and weights when you built the thing in PyTorch or whatever. So I just want to kind of share. Um, and it does mean that then you can have your own custom model uh, or you can modify an existing model, you can add or subtract to it, and the PEFT library will work. You just have to follow the naming conventions. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention that's that's really interesting about the prompt tuning stuff is you can actually swap them out completely freely because you're changing the inputs. You're not changing any of the model itself. So you can train a hundred different prompt tunes and then you're just changing the input that you pass to the model. So you can swap them in and out and you're not doing any reloading of weights or, or addition of matrices or any of that. You're, you're just basically saying here, I have new input, pass it to a model. And so you can do this kind of crazy thing where you just have, um, my, my vision of it is like you have one big, really well-served mega model in the middle that's just llama 7b or 70b or whatever whatever you can afford to do inference on and then everyone is just passing their their task embeddings to it um so you just have a single central model you don't have to have everyone deploying their own and having 70 different deployments of of the same model you just have a central one that's hyper optimized and everyone can use it 
Um, so that's one of the cool things about prompt tuning is you're, you're training the input, which is kind of weird, but it makes it um, extremely flexible and, and uh, you can use that to your advantage. Um, so just little tour of PEFT, we, we saw it in the lab a little bit, uh, but just to dig in a little bit more. Um, so they have these PEFT configs and these kind of define um, the, the different parameters that, that you want to do. So for this one, it's specifically a LoRa config and you have certain options with that. Um, so this is, this is the dimension of the low rank. So this is the, this is the value that we were talking about before. It could be one, it could be eight, it could be 32. Um, you're, you're kind of choosing your reduction there. Um, and so they also have, um, so you, you have your config and then you have your model and your model is, is kind of just a wrapper around some existing model and they have a set of models that they support. And it's a lot of the, the big ones that, that have been, uh, common recently. So it's, it's llama and, and, uh, the GPT Neo X and probably Flan T5, um, and a, a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, but the, the way that you end up doing this is, is you say, um, you, you import this function, get peft model, and then you have some base model. So this is, this is your model that was just original chat model or base model or something else. And you wrap it with this. Um, and what it will do is it will go and it will take your config and it will apply it to that model and get you a new model out. Um, and so this will kind of apply your LoRa or your prompt tuning or whatever, and it kind of just hides it all from you. It just does it in the background. So you take your base model and then you wrap it, and then now you can train it, you can do inference with it. Um, it's it's very seamless and in the background. Um, they put a bunch of work, like like Ted was saying, kind of standardizing the format so that they can be applied on, on a bunch of different things. Um, So they, they have a bunch of different um, examples here, depending on what you're trying to do. So you can actually apply LoRa for image classification. It's not limited to just large language models. You can use it in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, they show prefix tuning and prompt tuning, and they also have um, associated notebooks for, for all of these different things. So I've spent a bit of time playing with a bunch of these. So like the conditional generation one, this is kind of the, the standard large language model one. And you can see there's a bunch of different options here um, and they show how to use it with Accelerate and with different levels of um, data parallel and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so if you're ever needing kind of a, a reference implementation, you can click into one of these and they've got good kind of minimal examples showing how you do these different things, how to prepare your data, how to train the model, how to reload the weights and stuff like that. Um, so if you're ever trying to do this on your own project, this is kind of a good place to, to start. Um, so one of the one of the things that was discussed, hopefully I can find it. There's a bunch of different things that you can do with these models. So, like we were we were talking earlier about, um, you can you can swap them out, you can turn them on and off. So, for for different models, there's different options. But for some of them, you can disable the adapter, so you go back to your base weights. Um, so that's just a simple function that you can call. Um, you can get the prompt back out for for certain things. You can save your prompt. Um, you can set your adapter. And so this is this is the stuff that we were talking about before. You can actually name your adapters and say, like, here's my math adapter, here's my reading adapter, here's my whatever, and you can name them, and then you can just kind of swap them in and out using the set adapter function. Um, and so that that's how you would do that if you ended up with a bunch of them. Um Trying to think if there's something else to show. So they they really have kind of um, 
a few different uh bases and so one of them is laura and the other one is the sort of prompt learning prompt tuning um all of that stuff and then there's a whole bunch of implementations under that where it's like do you do laura do you do q laura and then on the prompt tuning side you can do prefix tuning you can do prompt tuning you can do p tuning um and then they have another one ia3 in there that i that i don't know much about um but um yeah, if you if you want to try these things out, this is this is where you would go for them. Um, very useful library, pretty easy to use if you've ever interacted with the hugging face models. You just kind of wrap this around them, um, and then you're good to go. Um, pause for any questions related to PEFT. All right, no questions. We can hopefully go into the workbench. Last time we had trouble with this. Don't see a green circle yet. Yeah, it's loading. I don't know. I don't know if I'm just unlucky, but every time I try to demo, it's gonna it's gonna chug and it's not gonna initialize. <laughs> and it times out, so you can't just like open it the night before. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was running it earlier. I guess I I guess I ate my credits already. Uh, if anybody has specific questions, I do have a local download that I did earlier. I think we might have to give up on that one. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, Ted, I had some questions, but I, I figured it out. I just had the wrong, uh, two extra large uh, model was trying the wrong one. So it said, oh, you know, permission. So I thought, okay, I'll stick with this little thing. <laughs> it's four gigabyte. And of course it fails. The, so. uh, oh yeah, that was that was kind of annoying. The, uh, which VM you choose? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the, well, the the machine size. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you- the, the type. They have a particular, it's in these instructions. They have a particular um, extra large that they've enabled. But if you pick a different one, even if it's the same size smaller. or just smaller, whatever, if it's not one of the two, then you get permissions denied. That took me, that wasted a good, whatever, five, 10 minutes. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting that either. Like I thought, oh, what about this medium here, you know? Oh, yeah, because week I've... one, I think, <laughs> I think none of the labs used much memory, so you could get away with the default small. Right. Medium. Right, I, because that one said you should change it, and it didn't matter. I thought it didn't matter this time, but it did, of course. I I clicked a few of them, and it said permission denied, and then I finally actually read the <laughs> directions, because it's actually in the directions which which one you should pick. But I tried running it by default, and same, same problem. I, I ran out of memory, and then I clicked around, and I was like, how do I get a different instance? And none of them were letting me through. And then finally, I, I found it in the, in the actual page. Yeah, please stand. Go ahead. Can I have one question? Um, I tried to the wrong uh, this local on my local machine. So when I started training, I saw the app is running, but I cannot see any uh, file. Uh, so did you run the local in your local? I I didn't run it locally, but one I wish I had the notebook open. But in in the trainer settings, I don't think that they actually had it set to save any weights. Um, 
so you you might have to look at the there I, I believe it's the training arguments um if you look in there there's like a save checkpoint or or something option um either that or just add a cell at the end that's model safe yeah and then it should save all of your weights to uh the the output folder yeah because i did see uh output dir is set but i don't think there's any default check checkpoint turned on. so i i think what happens is the save strategy by default is set to steps and mm -hmm. then they say that the default is 500 and I don't think that it's configured to even do 500 steps of training. So I don't think that you're getting a model back out because it doesn't do 500 steps of training. So one, one option is just set the number of steps higher and it'll it'll get you 500 steps and then it'll save the model at, at that point. Or you can do what Ted said and, and basically trigger it to manually save at the end. Okay, I see. thank you. Yeah, and I think the extra large VM was a 32 gig GPU, is that right? So I've got 24 My... gigs, and so there's no guarantee that it'll fit. I wasn't sure if they even had GPUs. Because yeah, if you think... look at the instance so. types, if you look at the instance types, it says like eight CPU, 32 gigs memory, but it's like regular memory. I don't think that it's... And so if you look at the training, it's actually set up to do a single step. It's not even... <laughs> so I, I sat there and I was like, why is this taking so long? And then it finally outputs and it says one step, 50 loss. And it's like, okay. <laughs> oh, because it just ran on CPU. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think it used the full memory. I, I was looking at it while it was training and I think it um, it might not have gone above 50%, I right. think. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, if you if you want to save the model, you can do the dot save model and define some output directory and then it'll throw everything you need in there. We have a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them, but that's that's all I have for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for uh, all the information you shared, Ryan. Um, I just have um, a question. It, uh, it was asked in the chat. So uh, in what, what you mentioned about Rouge and the Bleu, uh, concerning that, that those measures are not that uh, uh, efficient, uh, you also mentioned the LLM judge. So can you please uh, give us more info about it? Yeah, I, I'm not necessarily the expert on that, but the, the, the theory is basically you can throw an LLM in as if they were a human and just evaluate its responses in a certain way. So um, let's say I train a model and then it outputs on some specific task and then I do a thousand of those, for example. And then I go and I send um, its response and I have chat GPT-4 or something evaluate its correctness in some way. Um, you're, you're passing it to an even stronger model, so it'll probably do a better job at, at evaluating um, the accuracy. But at the same time, it's also the, the secondary model has an advantage in that it's just trying to guess true false was this correct or not um, which is much easier than trying to generate and recall the the correct answer um, so that's kind of the premise there um, what a lot of people are doing now is basically you have a first pass inference where you're you're generating some sequence and then you have a second pass where you're saying 
is this actually true or not? And you can kind of see some funny quirks related to this. A lot of people on Twitter are like showing that you can confuse a model a whole bunch by saying like, can you double check the work that you just did when it did something wrong? And then it'll go back and forth and it'll like reevaluate its position. And then it might get the answer right at the end um, in hindsight. But that's, I mean, it, it's an open area of study. Like, can we use these LLMs as kind of human proxies instead of um, sitting there and evaluating all of them by hand if they're correct or not? Uh, because it's it's very very difficult to do and to scale to to actually make a thousand prompts and say is is this good or not at this specific thing, um, and so the the LLMs are imperfect, but they can actually kind of approximate what what a human might do evaluating these things. Does that add any uh, yeah. color to it? Yep, that's totally uh, understood now. Thank you. It sounds like the next step is like tr uh, letting bigger models, training smaller models, even creating the training data and then evaluating them for specific tasks. Yeah, there's, there's a whole area of study of basically how do you get um, good output from the bigger models in order to teach smaller ones. Um, some people are calling that curriculum learning. And so I, I read this interesting paper, I forgot what it was called, but it was basically, um, how do you get good diversity out of GPT-4 in order to teach another model? And so they narrowed it down to this, like write a good children's book. Um, and so it's this very narrow domain but um, if you just say, write, write a children's book, GPT-4 will write one that's very similar over and over again in different ways. It won't have enough variety to actually teach, teach the model um, that well. And so what they did is they actually took, like, I forgot what the vocabulary set was, but it was like 5,000 approved, like, good fifth grader words and they basically said, okay, GPT-4, now you have to build a story that uses this word and this word and this word. And so forcing it to utilize those gave it much better um, variety that it was teaching the smaller model. And so they were able to condense kind of the scale of the GPT-4 model into a tiny, tiny little model by getting this really uh, high richness data set out of it. Um, and people have have been trying that for um math and coding and all of these other things because gpt4 is extremely powerful but how do you condense it how do you make your own um and so people have had a lot of success with that thank you uh ryan that's very interesting that what you just said about the uh word restriction uh in a way there's this uh technique for human creativity right where constraints are good for artistic endeavors and that seems like parallel to that. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Tiny Books or something like that. We'll have to see if I can find. It was from Microsoft. I know that. But yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. It's It's, it's kind of how do you distill out the information from these even better models that we don't have great access to? Because there's, there's one thing to just kind of copy it, but you need to copy enough of the model to get something useful out. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, every time I log on to chat GPT 3.5, it still says September 2021. And on the main screen, it says September 25th of this year, the last time it was trained. Has anybody had access with any of these <laughs> of like the most recent chat GPT? I haven't I haven't personally played with it yet. I've seen all of this stuff on Twitter, the the incredible 
additional vision stuff that's been added in recently. Everyone's been showing screenshots of that. They show a little napkin drawing of a website and then it just builds the whole code out for them, which is really cool. But um, yeah, I, I, I haven't personally gotten access yet. Yeah, I saw that too. I, I haven't been able to access it and I don't think they're talking uh, four. I think they're still talking 3.5. Mm -hmm. Have you seen models conversing each other? Two chat GPT models conversing each other, like discussing on a subject. So I believe they have this uh, memory limit. Like how what did what did they say in the past that memory? So chat GPT remembers your uh, questions and then answers if you refer your previous previous questions and. If it has that kind of memory, it should be also keep up a conversation, two models, and then generate some interesting conversations. Yeah, you could just type in, when was this model last trained? And I think on mine, it still says September 2021. Yeah. So saw... September 21 is the cutoff date for the data that goes into ChatGPT, but it was trained more recently than that, right? Yeah, I mean, so, when you want the data that after 2021? I, I, I mean, I guess that would be nice, but I mean, the thing is there's always going to be some cutoff. And so if, if some company, if some country decides to change their capital from city A to city B, there's going to be a cutoff date and the model's not going to know about changes more recent than that. So open AI is not trying to play that game. They're not trying to say this thing knows current events up till last week. They're yeah. just saying we cut it off at two years ago. So there's not even, you know, it's not One even in the conversation. They're not saying this thing knows who was elected last month. One of one of the things that they're adding though is is that similar function like like Bing Chat had, where it will do a Google search and then it can have more up to date information based on the internet, um, and I think that that's going to continue to be the path of things. It, one of one of the things that Sam Altman talked about a while is trying to figure out how they get less of the model to be about learning facts and more of it to be about reasoning. Because right now they have this 175 billion parameter model or trillion parameter model. And a lot of it is kind of wasted on memorizing who is a president in 1984 or something like that, when really they want a model that's extremely good at reasoning and synthesizing um, and all of that stuff, and then has access to the information and can pull it out when it needs it. Because right now our parameters are kind of storage. They're not reasoning capability. And so that's that's one of the problems that they're trying to tackle. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it returns answers in just all these paragraphs. It's so much more convenient than like if you do a Google search and you're sifting through web pages, trying to find specific things. Now, I think they switched it. It's Bing now on uh, ChatGPT. So I don't know the exact, you know, the connections between how they've done things previously. And now they have all the Bing information too. I think there are two models that are not they're they're actually quite I find them quite different and then uh just yesterday I saw a review paper uh that went through and looked at what they're calling the web versions and the um the non-web versions like the the GPT uh, open AI and then there was like another company so uh, what I know, based on my experience and what I have heard, the web ones are updated. Um, actually, you could use a specific version, a fixed sliced model where it stops changing. And there's like a March 2023 and June 2023, I think is the current one now. 
it's by default and but you could go in the open ai you can go and say i want the march version um or i want the latest version and they change a little bit and then there are there are abilities change like drift over time so like um i think in math gpt4 march version was smarter it it, it became much dumber in math but uh, in reasoning it improved and also in when they open ai posted stuff on live especially on bing bing has become quite different because uh, people were trying to trick it and get it to, you know, disclose how to make bombs and things like that. So they really locked it down. <laughs> so it's it was the later version of Bing is much likely to say, I don't know, I can't help you with that and just like be not helpful. And then they had to, then it became too much that way and they had to tune it back. And so the, the Bing version definitely, it seems to change weekly, even though, there, there is like a main rewrite. So even yeah. if the, the data is not changing, they're constantly giving it feedback. Now, the last time I tried GPT-4, it was still trained in September 2021. Are you able to access the most recently trained version? Uh, yes. I So the data is September 2021, but the human feedback has updated a lot. And I think the default one, when I just go in, is the June one, June 2023. And you have to ask to, um, I went into setting, I saw some YouTuber that explained it. If you go into a setting and open AI, you can say, I want the March one or I want the June one. You can, but the default is, I think, the June one, June 2023, unless you change it on the settings. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, chat GPT 3.5 saves a ton of time for me because like if I want to like research a certain topic, I can start there. Then I can move into specific areas that now I understand the industry, you know, that sometimes um, even YouTube won't have. Right. Why are you using 3.5? Because for me, I always get four. Like I have to actually try to get the 3.5 or 3.5 turbo. Uh huh. Yeah, like I said, I think you have to. I I think you have to pay for four, and then like no, I, I saw get, that I it's not. <laughs> oh, you did. Yeah, yeah, I saw that it's not. You know, it still says September twenty one based on its knowledge, and I was like, oh. why did I upgrade to this? You know, that's very strange because I I uh, I I thought that they pretty much they pushed everyone to GPT four back in. March of 2023, as of that, unless you ask for it, they'll just give you GPT, GPT-4 and then the latest version. So maybe you're, at some point, you ask for a specific model. And you can select it. Uh -huh. And maybe you never change it back to a default. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the other thing is, Kevin, you keep bringing up 21, and I want to make sure you understand that the main corpus that chat GPT and just GPT in general was trained on was a copy of the internet and all that other stuff, Wikipedia, books, all that, with a cutoff of 2021. That is not when your model was trained. There's no way you're running. First of all, this thing didn't even exist in 21, okay? So you are running a model that is less than a year old. That's just the cutoff of the main corpus of data. So anything that was edited in Wikipedia after September 21, you're not going to see that because they're not updating the, that training data. But like like Jennifer said, uh, the RLHF and the other fine tuning they're doing, they're constantly doing that. And I'm seeing new versions every couple of weeks. So I have a I, question. I, oh, go ahead. Uh, to do with sort of like the knowledge base. I think Ryan was speaking about it. Do you guys know like or have any recommendations of like what would you say is like the most uh, best method uh, to train to kind of like create a knowledge base um, for your GPT to kind of access and relay information? So 
So uh, Ryan, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say maybe just administratively, uh, yeah. Maybe we want to end the recording and then we can welcome the new people that have arrived and then we can just keep going with the questions, but at least formally draw a line. All right. Well, we'll end previous session here.